Um, all right. Well, now that we are both here in Audible, um, I'll just start by saying thank you so much for joining us today. I am Ariana Kudanas. I'm the founder of this page, The Peaceful Poetry of Cyprus. And I am joined by Lilia Kapsali, who is a dear friend, a cousin, probably. <laughs> and um, we wrote this poem together that we're going to share with you shortly in solidarity with the protests, both that happened last weekend and that happened yesterday. And we'd be so happy to have this chat be as interactive as possible. So for those of you that were able to join yesterday uh, in the protests or have particular feelings about it, um, please do chime in. We'd be so happy to hear. Um, but first, I'll just start by asking Lily a few questions. So your Instagram handle is very intriguing. It's Venus de Louisiane. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so it's, you. yeah, sure. For, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm really excited about this live. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so Venus de Louisiane is an allusion to uh, basically both my countries, my country of origin, which is Cyprus, the island of Aphrodite, um, and also Louisiana, which is the place where I'm currently living in the United States. Um, but it's also uh, this tongue-in-cheek allusion to um, the idea that I want to reclaim, which is um, my background is in environmental education. So I'm really interested in um, the beauty and love for life um, and reclaiming our subjectivity, not just knowing about life, but participating in life. And um, I find that uh, engaging in my heritage um, and uh, this concept of Aphrodite and Venus um, is very generative for me. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. <clears throat> and before we read our, speaking of life, before we start reading our poem, Tending to All Life, can you tell us a bit about um, your relationship with Cyprus, your identity, you know, your roots, where you come from, what brings you to where you are today? Yeah, so I grew up in Cyprus. Um, I left uh, to go to university when I was uh, 19. I shortly went back and worked in environmental conservation. Um, and then I met my husband and moved to the United States. So I've been living in the United States for seven years now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I consider myself Cypriot. Um, I follow everything that happens in Cyprus. And um, even though I can't participate in the protests and everything that's been happening throughout the years, so there's been a lot of environmental um, action and reaction and a lot of political developments that have been very disappointing. Um, so I've been following everything and my mind is always there and I'm always talking to my friends back in Cyprus and um, really uh, thank everyone on the ground who is doing all the work. Absolutely. Yeah. I share those sentiments. Um, I myself, for those who don't know me, I'm a, a Cypriot American and go to Cyprus as often as I can, but of course cannot be there right now, especially um, with the pandemic, but especially having the American perspective where, um, you know, we protest a lot or at times there are many things going on that we really need to be protesting about, including the Black Lives Matter movement this past summer. Um, we had, you know, thousands of people in the streets um, many days <laughs> all summer. And it was so incredibly moving, even just from this distance, to see the volumes of people that were out yesterday, both in the South and in the North, in solidarity. So thank you all for those of you who were out there and doing other things to support the cause. Um, and before we do get started with the reading, Lily, if you'd like to say anything about... Um, the feelings that you had, you know, this past week, especially, but I'm sure your whole life, you've had many feelings about, um, you know, the government, Cyprus, things that are handled or mishandled. Uh, what really moved you to, to want to collaborate in writing this poem this week? Yeah, you know, that's a, uh, the question about feelings is such a big question. And I think that's why we all appreciate poetry, because it's a medium that helps us 
um, express ourselves. And I didn't always write poetry. Um, I think when I lived in Cyprus and growing up in Cyprus, there's a tremendous feeling of uh, hopelessness that often comes up and um, powerlessness and just anger that you live with, um, with the way the politicians are behaving. Um, but lately I've been getting a lot of hope from a lot of the young people on the ground in Cyprus on both sides. And um, there's been, it just seems like even though the politics is disappointing and we're at a very bad place with the checkpoints closed and the discussions kind of collapsed, um, I just feel like the people there are, I still want to be talking to each other, still want to write poetry with each other. I think your Instagram is an amazing example. And so I just want to hold on to this, um, this hope in dark times because I think that's the only thing that we can work on and move with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, and how, well, do you, how do you okay. feel? I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about how you've been feeling watching all of this because um, the violence we've been seeing from the police is something that we see and are used to in the United States. But for me, it was shocking to see those same tactics used against uh, the people in Cyprus. Like mm -hmm. it's not something we've been um, faced with before um, right. mm -hmm. in terms of police brutality. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say that it feels like a role rever reversal with you and I, where you and I will compare, you know, your education growing up in Cyprus and mine in the U.S. And while, of course, the U.S. education system could be tremendously better, especially in terms of how we gloss over a lot of our history, there's a lot of revisionist history. Um, you know, you telling me about museums that you would go to growing up or the different forms of indoctrination education and the normalization of violence and that to me in that context of education was very shocking to imagine and by contrast i felt that and you've talked about feelings of almost being desensitized to violence in certain ways because you were so conditioned to it um and by contrast i know that when there was the violence last weekend. I was, of course, also having the context for Cyprus. I was very frightened by knowing that that is not, especially not normal there, not like it should be normal anywhere, but also this layer of feeling like, oh yeah, but this is what was happening all last summer. This is what happens with so many protests and seeing media that was under reporting who was turning out as well. These were all very familiar things <laughs> that unfortunately just seemed normal. And um, I saw someone had shared the song, the, the Childish Gambino song, This Is America. And there was a lot of sentiment of, this is not America, this is Cyprus, this is not the way we do things. And not being surprised by that attitude, but being very ashamed as both a Cypriot and an American. Yeah, this is our reputation. This is the reality of how the US unfortunately often handles issues of activism and police brutality being such a big part of that. Um, so that is, yeah, I had a lot of feelings about that. And if you want to respond at all to that, feel free. <laughs> um, um, I mean, I think you brought up a good point, which I don't want to introduce a lot of new <laughs> concepts before we read our, our poetry. Yeah, we can elaborate. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, people here in the United States are dealing with partitions, right? And they're dealing with segregation. Um, black Americans are being oppressed. Um, and there are, um, it's a very different story, but um, this idea of uh, power and oppression is present all over the world. And I think Cypriots can learn a few things from uh, their brothers and sisters in the United States. And I think the people in the United States um, have to open also their vision to the world and see that there's um, similar fights being done in, in Israel and Palestine, Cyprus, um, all over the world. Uh, people are, are faced with the same evils. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so Absolutely. we can all learn from each other's struggles. Absolutely. 
Well, I would say let's dive into the poem and then we can go from there. And if people have any questions, you know, we'll, we'll start with an analysis of the poem after we read it and then can kind of spread that into general societal commentary. But any questions or reactions, we'd love to see them in the chat. Uh, so I will kick us off. We're going to go back and forth stanza by stanza. And this is called Tending to All Life. Violence happens in very small ways at first. A cruel word, a trust broken, a life pricked with paper cuts. Minor assaults grow bolder, and at last, succumbing to serrated blades of power, an open system is replaced with a series of closed doors, private properties, national identities, barbed wires. Water cannons once dislodged luminous rocks from California hillsides. Today, the only ore we have are our eyes that dare to envision a future. The nihilistic Giclobes by whom we are governed only predict our death, then finance our demise. The path that they prescribe for us, no country, no nature, no belonging. While they are constructing walls, domes, towers, and glue traps, looting the land and spreading clouds laced with poison by the so-called divinely ordained, oh, blessings of egoism, entropy, and erosion, they are too blind to see that the blasted rocks from an aval form an avalanche and the raindrops a raging river. Enough, enough, enough. The only gold I recognize is that of Bafos sunsets, the beaches of Rizogarpaso, the oak laja of Trodos, the wheat of Mesauria plain, the sandstone of Lefkosia, Chrysaleusa, Chrysalignodisa, Chrysiaphroditi. Now only an act of justice and goodwill can staunch the wound and begin the healing that leads to outstretched hands linking together, forming bridges over fissures, people relating, roots reawakening, tending to all life. And it ends with the title of our poem. Um, so with that, let's talk a bit about the, the process um, in which this was formed. And for those of you listening in or who will be listening to this recording, this poem is also, it was just published on this page, Peaceful Poetry of Cyprus. And um, we typically always publish our poems in all three languages of Cyprus. This one, because we just wrote it, is only in English for now, but we will be publishing it in Cypriot Greek and Cypriot Turkish in the coming weeks. So just a heads up for that. Um, so yeah, let's talk a bit about our process, Lilia. So how, so I'll start actually by saying that this came about when we were talking about the water cannon, we were talking about, um, you know, the, the violence in the protests, the corruption that led to this outcry. Mm -hmm. And you said the words violence happens in very small ways. And I just really latched on to that and, and thought about the power of those words and how, um, you know, one intrusion, one attack, even on an individual in a small level um, can amplify. And when we think about so many of our traumas in the context of Cyprus and so many of our issues, we really think about the disintegration of, at a societal level and at a human level so I'll just start with that, um, but feel free to, to share, you know, how you kind of yeah. went to the start of this. And I think our conversation when, that day when we, t we were talking about what was happening in Cyprus, um, I think we were talking about our personal experiences and how um, violence, you know, police brutality, uh, war, don't just start out of nowhere, right? Like they, mm -hmm. they're cultivated through culture, um, the education system, um, calling people barbarians, um, uh, picking out differences between the students, like um, when you disrespect your friend, when, uh, when you break a trust, like all those small things end up being a culture which then ends up 
in certain levels of uh, corruption and uh, oppression by the government and and the police. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how we started. And that was the idea behind um, an open system, because as a child, you just experience life so spontaneously and so openly. Um, uh, you, you don't have this idea that you're better than someone else. Mm. Um, and then slowly, you know, you get fed in all this stuff about identities and separations and enemies. Um, and here we are. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to mm -hmm. ask. Uh, yeah. What does mm -hmm. it what does it mean to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I'll just reiterate the line. Re replacing, and this was Lilia's words, replacing an open system with closed ones, private, um, or rather it's, um, an open system is replaced yeah, yeah. with yeah, a series of closed side. doors. Yeah. Private properties, national identities and barbed wires. Um, and I, I thought that those visuals were just incredibly powerful, especially as we think about, you know, you don't have to look that far. You can just think within the last few weeks, the destruction of historic buildings, properties that were done by the church um, in Cyprus and the uproar that came from that very rightfully so um, by Cypriots all over national identities. We think about the corruption with the golden passports, um, not to mention our own identity is being co-opted, being told not that we're Cypriot first and foremost, but that we're Greek or that we're Turkish and that, um, that these have ethnic and racial underpinnings and not that we are all a genetic mix of one another. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. Um, and I'm really glad you brought in the, dis the destruction of, uh, you know, our cultural heritage, because in the work I do um, as environmental educator and, and my writing, I like to link um, the different realms that usually we think are separate. So the environment and politics and culture, they're not separate things. So when we're protesting for justice, we're also protesting for the protection of nature, right? When we're protesting for the protection of nature, we're really talking about women's rights. So at first glance, those things are not connected, mm -hmm. but in truth, they really are. So when you see a building, um, a sandstone building that's been sitting there for you know 100 years um, to be knocked down, that's an assault. And it's the same assault as privatizing a beach that should belong to all of us and bringing in the tractors and destroying that beach um, or trapping birds and looting the, the natural heritage is um, on the same level as looting um, the, the economy of Cyprus mm -hmm. by selling these golden passports. So in my mind, they're all connected. And I think that's what we try to bring in to this poem, that mm -hmm. our problems are um, interconnected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So going to the, the next stanza, water cannons once dislodged luminous rocks from California hillsides. Today, the only ore we have are our eyes. That also, most of that were your words. So I'd love to hear, um, let everyone hear a little bit about where that's coming from now, having in mind your environmental background as well. So I think we were talking about the water cannon, right? And how shocking uh, of a weapon that is. Um, and I think after our conversation, I did some research and I realized that water cannons were used during the gold rush in California to blast uh, rocks out of the mountain. So it's literally uh, something with great force that's used mm -hmm. to like um, blast, you know, used in mining, which then brought an image of the golden passports, right? So this um, connection between the, the greediness, if you will, mm -hmm. of the human being to blast gold out of a mountain mm -hmm. and the greediness to sell one's own country um, and one's own identity um, in order to get millions and millions. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that was the 
connection there that mm-hmm. um, Anastasia's the woman who mm-hmm. who got blasted with the water cannon. Um, she got blasted because she wanted a different future, right? She had a vision uh, of something different mm-hmm. uh, for her country and herself. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's what we were expressing in that mm-hmm. stanza. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Which then leads into the nihilistic Giclopes, um, by whom we are governed. And I really love the visual of, you know, these Giclopes or Cyclops, who are so myopic in their focus that they only have this one eye. Um, yeah. They, yeah. And of course, the, the Giclobus were cursed by Zeus. Um, and I think their only, uh, you know, power was to predict the future, but um, they ended up being able to predict their own death. So I thought that was an interesting um, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, idea that the people who govern us, they're, they're sort of willfully blind, if you will, to the future mm-hmm. that they're taking us to, which is not viable. Yes. Yeah, our, our natural environment is being destroyed. Um, mm-hmm. our, our air, our water, um, our birds, our biodiversity. Um, how can you live on an island I mean, we don't even have uh, a policy for climate change in Cyprus. And we know that Cyprus is already suffering with desertification. Um, and then the, the political future. What is the, how can they expect young Cypriots to be able to live in a country that is divided? You know, that it's, mm-hmm. it's a non-viable, non-sustainable future for us. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's where the words no country, no nature, no, no belonging came in. Mm-hmm. And also, yeah, before we move to the next stanza, so only predict our death, then finance our demise. The finance our demise, I believe that had been my insertion. Yeah. And I was really thinking about it in terms of, you know, where your tax money is going, where the dollars that you are trusting in these institutions is truly being spent. Is it being responsibly spent? Or is it only being spent in a, that, um, that serves the status quo, that serves a self-fulfilling pro- prophecy, which is to predict our own death and our own demise, the destruction of our environment by selling it out to the whims of capitalism, the destruction time and time again of any opportunity for a true and viable solution to the Cyprus alternative. Uh, wow, I just said the Cyprus alternative. That's how positive thinking I am. I can't <laughs> even say the problem. I want the alternative. Yeah. I want the solution. Um, that was pretty funny. Um, yeah. Okay. So now moving on, um, we made some reference to the the destruction of historic buildings uh, recently. Um, so now going into while they're constructing walls, domes, which is, of course, a reference to the opulence of the church, which is, you know, the, the largest real estate owner on Cyprus, towers um, and glue traps. Can, can you talk about what you meant by glue traps? Yeah, so and this is. I realize that this is going to be controversial um, to <laughs> oh, discuss. Oh, I think this whole thing is controversial. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I don't know how much people know that uh, the people who are illegally trapping birds in Cyprus. Mm-hmm. So that glue trap refers to uh, lime sticks um, that people use to trap uh, birds in Cyprus. But they don't just use glue traps. They use nets. So it's Mm -hmm. a military scale operation. And then they Mm -hmm. sell these birds to the black market. Um, And of course, there's a lot of problems with trapping, which you can read. Um, Certain nature organizations have come out with a lot of information about why it's a terrible, terrible thing for the biodiversity, not just of Cyprus, but of Europe. Mm -hmm. Um, So these same people that are supporting illegal trapping um, are, are also the people in certain political party. Um, and some of these people are openly supporting this illegal destructive activity. Mm-hmm. Um, so to me, these are the same people who are, and the people who vote for them, of course, who support this mm-hmm. political party. It's the same people who um, are, have brought us to the situation we are in. And, 
um, it's the same greed, you know, that's hiding behind this black market of the destruction of nature. It's the same greed that wants to build these high towers. It's the same mm -hmm. greed that wants to privatize the beaches. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, if we don't talk about the environment uh, in the mix, mm -hmm. um, and of course, the way you treat the environment, the new generation starts thinking in those terms. So if you only have grown up around uh, degraded ecosystems and dirty beaches and high-rise buildings you don't remember you don't remember how it how cyprus really can be and how beautiful it is and um yeah mm -hmm. so yeah. i'm talking i'm talking i'm rambling on but you're not rambling at all <laughs> um i should have said this from the beginning but as everyone can probably tell at this point this is a very close our whole discussion is just framed around a very close reading of this poem that we wrote together and as we make references to each of these um these metaphors um, and otherwise, please feel free to drop your own thoughts in, you know, of what each of these can mean to you. So I saw that the Cypriot story also pointed out Cyclops will be a new American military organization in Nicosia. Was that at all on your mind when you put that in there, Lilia? No, I did not yeah. know that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah. And, and also, yeah, it's especially knowing your background, working with the, the organization, the environmental organization in Cyprus, it makes sense that that's what glue traps would have been interpreted to you. Um, I also think about our, our migrants, you know, our many workers who come over and who are paid very little, who are treated as if they do not exist and who will often have their passports illegally withheld from them by their employers. So talk about a glue trap. These are people who are literally being stuck on our island. Um, while they have come to, you know, support their families overseas and not to mention human trafficking as well, yeah. which is an enormous problem. Um, uh, and many of you probably know and have even attended, we had um, a panel that was co-hosted through Peaceful Poetry of Cyprus and, um, and several others on February 12th. And that was the, that was called Exploring the Cypriot Identity. That was the first of a series that will be happening in discussions that are unpacking various la layers of identity. And we will definitely also, we will be covering a lot of the topics that we're covering today. Uh, but we have especially been also discussing that as we talk about being Cypriot, and it can often come in the form of distinguishing between what side of the island you live on or what which one of the, you know what we think of as the historic core identities um, or ethno linguistic groupings within Cyprus we have to also consider our new coming immigrants and how they fit into being a part of Cyprus that should also be equitable that should also be human centered and they should have equal rights to all of us um, I'm just looking at the chat here. We have Liman Poetry who says, it's beautiful how all the imagery originates from Cypriot issues, but it is still international. It's a poignant commentary in the di divisive world as a whole. Absolutely. Um, and Cypriot story said Cyclops, that's the, the military operations, the first thing that they thought of when they saw the word in the poem. Definitely occurred to me as well. Um, all right. So now moving on from glue traps, we have Looting the land and spreading clouds laced with poison by the so-called divinely ordained. And this was truly such a collaborative effort. I'm like, I can't remember who exactly said I th what. I, I think this was yours. And I, yeah. uh, I wondered, I asked you before if that was yeah. the image you had of that painting. I don't know if you wanted to talk more about oh, that. Oh, right. Yeah. For those of you not familiar with George Gabriel, he is an amazing artist who's had um, some very poignant social commentary in his art lately. Um, he's on Instagram if you want to check out George Gabriel with a V at the end, um, or in his last name, rather. Um, but he does have um, an image where there, there are a couple that are religious figures and one has a gas mask on and is kind of spraying noxious fumes and the other is another it's a priest in a robe who's the top of his half is a crane showing you know conveying the destruction of the buildings that were taken down so i definitely at least in the subconscious had some of that imagery in mind um and i also think about um 
you know, there are people who say that cloud seeding is a thing where they people like put chemicals in the clouds either to make it rain or to make certain pollutants, you know, come down in certain places. So I was kind of thinking of that, of, of, of those, whether they be religious leaders, political leaders, thinking back to our colonial history in Cyprus and how it is the belief of monarchies that, it, that they are actually divinely ordained. It is God who determined that they should be in these positions of royalty and power. So kind of all of that was being conjured up as I thought about, yeah, you originate from the heavens and from there is also from kind of the source. We think of the intersection of the environment, point source pollution, that we can be spewing all of these um, gluten's, you know, from inception, and we don't even really get into directly referencing education in this poem. But if we think about the origin of various forms of poison and tox toxicity and indoctrination, a lot of which was referenced in the wonderful poem that we published uh, a recording of yesterday on our page, you know, um, I think all of that was kind of packed in there in various ways. Um, and I really loved your insertion of, oh, blessings of egoism, entropy, and erosion, if you'd like to speak a bit to that. <laughs> yeah, so again, in environmental education, we ask ourselves, why are humans destroying nature? And of course, part of nature is other humans. So um, why are we destroying nature? Why are we destroying each other? And it's a, it's a big uh, topic, but... Um, at the core, which also touches upon indigenous um, uh, cultures. For example, in Australia, indigenous people talk about um, the curse of thinking you are greater than. So mm -hmm. the, moment, the moment you start thinking you are greater than someone else or a plant or a, a, an animal or a tree, that's when the sickness sets in, right? So... Um, this idea that we are the chosen people, that we are divinely ordained, um, that we are um, better than the rest of our compatriots, mm -hmm. um, we are better than other religions, we are better than animals, that is a virus, that is a curse. Um, and the consequences of that lead to a chain reaction of um, destruction, really, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where egoism, entropy, and erosion came in because I wanted to link the ways of thinking that we are better than uh, or that we are, are holier than thou with the, the material world, so the landscape, the erosion that's actually happening, mm -hmm. and entropy, which is chaos, which is um, <laughs> the, what we're seeing in the streets right now, both in the United States and in Cyprus, in the, in the whole world. Um, so the, it's at the heart of uh, my, my problem with a lot of modern spiritualities and religions is that they neglect the material world and they tell us that we have to think of heaven. And meanwhile, we have very real problems here and we should have the goodwill and, um, you know, the, the wherewithal to deal with them. And mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and incidentally, I mean, we're going to talk about it in the next verse, but uh, the cult of Aphrodite, Aphrodite, Aphrodite in Cyprus um, mm -hmm. was um, a pre-Christian cult. Um, and I draw inspiration from, from those pre-Christian cults because they were, they were very much about honoring um, nature and the cycles of the season and the material world. So their spirituality, because they had a spirituality um, connected um, heaven and earth. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're getting a little more philosophical here, but I think that's what <laughs> I was, that's what I had in mind behind mm -hmm. um, those words. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. We'll delve more into that. And uh, Cypriate with Sign says, Lilia, you are amazing. And I do agree. <laughs> and Cypriate <laughs> with Sign, I was just telling her that she needs to meet your cousin who is down the road from her in New Orleans. Oh, yeah, New Orleans. <laughs> so we'll make Absolutely. that happen offline after this. <laughs> um, okay, so still in that same stanza, you started referencing it with the erosion, but um, the, the, I'll just reread the last few lines. They are too blind to see that the blasted rocks form an avalanche 
and the raindrops a raging river. Enough, enough, enough. There, if anywhere in this poem, which again was mostly your beautiful writing, I think really captures the momentum of enough is enough. And this is why we protest. And this is when we protest is because we have been wronged. We have been violated. And all of these, you know, seemingly small, um, you know, small ways of enacting violence um, hit a tipping point where truly enough is enough. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything else about that before. Um, just, <laughs> I think the, the image of the avalanche of the rocks turning into an avalanche and the rain drops a river was actually you. Um, <laughs> I have such a bad I, memory. Wow. <laughs> and I, I added this uh, enough because that's the message of the, the protest that happened yesterday. Their slogan was Ozdame. So mm -hmm. basically we've had it, we've had it yeah. up to here. So mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. um, which I thought was very clever and expressed my feelings as well. Absolutely. Very universal feelings, I would say. Okay, so I won't reread the whole thing. If you want to, you can. But it begins with the only gold I recognize. And I know you were very intentional in that. So if you'd like to share a bit about that. Yeah, so go moving from the idea of like, gold and this greediness of gold and all, all this stuff with the golden passports and the golden robes of the priests. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to capitalize gold because it sounds like God. Um, and just to say that I, I wanted to offer some images from na the nature and the landscape of Cyprus that um, are golden and mm -hmm. that all those experience, all those images have behind them um, certain experiences for me. Um, Can you elaborate on them? I think I would love to hear it. I'm sure. Others yeah. Do. So when I was thinking about Bafo sunsets, um, I'm sure some of the people here uh, will recognize that there's a campsite in Polis Chrysochus. Um, you know, that's on the north west really west side of the island um where when the sun sets everything just sort of becomes uh golden and it's a place where growing up i had many good memories with my friends mm -hmm. um and just the nature there is beautiful so it brings up this um this feeling of me, for me that that's that's what cyprus is it's like the sunsets you know like the sunsets by the beach with friends with a a beer, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then I was thinking of the beaches of Rizzo Carpaso or Deep Carpaz, um, which of course I'd never experienced as a child. But um, when we were able to cross the checkpoints, um, there, are, there are these golden beaches where the turtles lay their eggs. And mm -hmm. I have never seen anything like it in the whole world. Um, not that I've traveled very widely, but it's just breathtaking, you know. Um, and then the oak, we have uh, the national tree of Cyprus, actually. I don't know how many people know this. is uh, <laughs> a, a type of oak called the laja. Mm -hmm. um, in English, it's called the golden oak. Uh, because under the underside of its leaves are actually golden. Like they have like this yellow color. So it's a glossy green on top and a golden color in the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I love trees. I love the trees of Cyprus. We have such a beautiful nature. And instead of talking about our nature and protecting our nature, um, we have this idea of what being successful means. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's so sad and disappointing to me. Um, then I was thinking of what, with the wheat of Mesauria Plain, I live in Cyprus. My parents' house is um, on the green line in Lafkosia, in Nicosia. So from my window, I can see sort of uh, part of the plain, the Mesauria Plain. And historically, they would um, plant wheat, wheat fields in, mm -hmm. in the plain. Um, and there's also a lot of... Uh, I don't know how many people again know that there's a lot of special species of birds that live on the plains of, of Mesauria, uh, mm. like the lark, um, there's finches, there's all, or, all sorts of beautiful birds. There's um, the endemic cypress wheat here, 
So anyway, I don't want to ramble again, but the You're last... You're not rambling. <laughs> <laughs> the last um, um, uh, image there is the sandstone. And of course, it's not just of Nicosia, it's uh, everywhere. But I've lived in... Um, in the neighborhood of Chrysalignorisa. I've also lived there and it's such a beautiful, beautiful area. And I was thinking of the sandstone buildings that they tore down in that area. Mm, Chryseleusa is in Strovolos and I know your family is from mm -hmm. old Strovolos as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then Chrysia Frodidi is um, Again, in uh, I think it's the Odyssey, Homer calls Afro Aphrodite um, Chrysia Aphrodite. And it's from Homer and all those uh, old um, poets and historians that we know that uh, Aphrodite was Cypriot, so they called her Kiprida. So again, it's just an image of, um, of Aphrodite being golden. And our, our real heritage, which is love of the land, love of the elements, um, love of each other, really. Absolutely. So well said. Thank you. Um, and, you know, in summary for that stanza, the Cypriot story said it best in the comments. Our island is the gold. I agree 100 percent. Cypriot with sign says Rizzo Carpazzo is one of the most beautiful places in Cyprus, Carpaz in general. Um, and the Cypriot story says Ayos Filon. <laughs> mm. um, so before we enter into the, the next stanza, because then we might just kind of wrap it up from there. I'd love if people, this is, um, L Lilia, you might hate me for saying this, but just knowing what a wealth of knowledge you are for the natural world and especially for Cyprus. Um, and I know that you have some thoughts maybe at some point in the future of starting some kind of educational programs, whether they're camps or schools, to really root children growing up in the environment and the knowledge of the old ways and, and some of the things that you referenced today, but there are volumes more. Would anyone like to hear more from Lilia in the future in, in some unknown platform? Oh, whether so it's so it's, cheeky. <laughs> well, there would be Instagram lives like this. I mean, I just know that on your own your own page, Venus de Louisiane, um, and also she runs, where she lives in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in the States, she runs a fantastic group called Baton Rouge Nature Connection, um, where she, she gets people together, you know, you say it, you, you tell them a little bit about that, and then we'll do the last stanza. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so it's just, it's an experimental thing. And it's, um, again, it's exploring these concepts, but in practice. So it's bringing people out to nature uh, to have a subjective experience of nature. So what does it mean to come alive? What does it mean to encounter trees and rivers with a curiosity and an openness um, that doesn't immediately um, violate them by categor categorizing them. So you are this, you are this. No, just this openness of just experiencing nature. Um, but I do want to recognize all my colleagues like in Cyprus who are doing an amazing, amazing yeah. job. And um, there are several organizations really close to my heart. Um, Bird Life Cyprus is one of them. And they... They, they would hate me for saying this, but they actually risk their lives as well. Mm. So being an environmentalist in Cyprus is still um, a controversial and dangerous thing. And they get accused of all kinds of things. And they do very uh, important work and they go to the parliament and they participate in, um, you know, all the, all the meetings that they have. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so please support the nature organizations in Cyprus. They need support. They need numbers. They need voices. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. There's so much more there. And, um, yeah, I was just going to say, people could just let Lilia know if they'd be interested in learning more about <laughs> the environment of Cyprus through the lens of her. I'll just leave it to you to think if there'd be a way to engage people, but they can use their voices, drop it in the chat. And the Cypriot story says, if if pandemic ends, I mean, let's not say if, let's say when, please. <laughs> uh, if pandemic ends, let's rent a bus and go across Cyprus all together. And Khan Pavlu, my dear cousin calling in, and um, hi Rita, my other cousin as well, um, did a fingers up and thumbs up to that. 
Um, and she says, um, it's a great story. Says, why is being loving and peaceful always punishable in Cyprus? Mm. All right. Well, yeah. here's where we get to the good, optimistic, uplifting end that Lily and I really tried to craft for you both, which um, we decided we'd wanted to do this the day after the protest, especially feeling that um, with so many more people turning out, there was going to be a lot more accountability and hopefully things would not turn violent as they did not. And it would be peaceful and pow a powerful moment, which I think we all feel that it was, I hope. Um, so this this final stanza, now only an act of justice and goodwill can staunch the wound and begin the healing that leads to outstretched hands linking together, forming bridges over fissures people relating, roots reawakening, tending to all life. So what do we think this act of justice and goodwill can look like in various ways, Lilia, just given, you know, the topic of our conversation today? You don't need to have all the answers, but even at a <laughs> human scale up to the highest rungs of power in the government, what can it look like? You know, I think uh, systems change is a really complex and difficult thing. Yeah. Um, but the great thing about it is that it's never direct. So I don't believe that it's going to come from the top down first. Yeah. Um, I think that it always starts with those little moments and those little acts um, that we do. And your uh, page, Peaceful Poetry of Cyprus, is exciting for me. And it's such an intervention because it's, it's doing a small thing. You know, it's bringing people together and it's getting them to write poetry and it's getting them to express their feelings. And we really haven't had much of that in Cyprus. Like usually we just shout at each other. Um, <laughs> and it's very difficult to get people to be vulnerable and um, express feelings because healing is going to come from healing and listening to each other and deep yeah. listening to each other. So the way we listen to a river flowing that's how we need to listen to each other. The way we listen to a nightingale uh, singing, that's how we need to listen to each other. And poetry is one of those ways. So I just wanted to tell people that the smallest thing they can do, be present with each, with each other, um, do something, like send a letter, um, use your voice, just the smallest thing. Reach out to a friend you haven't talked to in a long while. Kindness, love, those those are not um, cute little luxury things. Those are the activism that is required um, at a moment in time when we are closed behind our own walls and not relating and not being able to come together. Those are the, the actions that I think um, can really make a difference. And what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I agree entirely. And um, yeah, I am very much a believer in systems thinking and that small human scale interventions and actions have major ripple effects. And it's not at all linear. And it's very iterative. And um, you know, this is the first collaborative poem that we've published on our page. And I've been thinking a lot about encouraging people to utilize poetry as a tool for healing. Now we've had about 20 po poems published. So a lot of people have done, at least started to scratch some of the surface with their own healing. Many, many people who've written poems on our page have never written poems before. And so I know that wow. that has been a transformational experience for them. And sometimes I even tell people, wow, you wrote this thing. This is a poem. And they're like, it is. <laughs> um, so poetry is everywhere. And I want to say that. And while I don't think poetry is going to solve everything, I would task and challenge every person listening into this that if you have a grandparent or a parent or a sibling or a friend or a neighbor or a complete stranger who you think could use some healing, invite them to write a poem with you. You don't know what will come out of it, but I know that Lilia and I had four hours on Zoom the other night just getting completely lost in the process of this. And actually most of the poem had already been written, but it was the deep thinking that we were doing about pulling out from the subconscious what in what way, where were these words coming from and how can we responsibly use the power of these words to, to lend some inspiration and some hope to those who will be receiving it. So I hope that that 
message has been received. And I do think that in the context of Cyprus continuing to, like we say here, outstretching our hands and linking together, we really can heal the wounds. We really can fill in the fissures with very rich soil that really sows positive, peaceful feelings and sentiments that turn into actions, that turn into the infrastructure for building this new, more tolerant, vibrant world that we're all hoping for. And I think no matter whether people consider themselves left to right, somewhere in the middle, we all want a good life. We all have fundamental values that we aspire to. And I hope that that can continue to be a vision that we can wield uh, without it becoming politicized, without it becoming a vision that is co-opted by some power that has a vested interest in keeping the status quo and keeping division there. So I would challenge everyone to constantly think of the ways um, that our autonomy is being challenged and, and ways and resources and people who, who can help us fight against that. And Um, so with that, I know that we're nearing the end. I see that Cypriot story says, we've never had an opportunity to express our feelings because our parents and grandparents went through so much that our feelings were insignificant almost. That is a powerful sentiment to end on. So do you have anything that you'd like to say in response to that, Lilia? I definitely have some, some thoughts. I don't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> um, just that I, I relate. I yeah. definitely relate to that. Yep, um, absolutely. And, you know, personally, like this is also a personal project for me, as all things are. Um, this whole poetry project, I essentially created as a new avenue to be able to talk about deep traumas and hard feelings and complex, you know, issues with my own family. So I hope that that can also be a guiding light for others who who feel like, you know, compared to what my parents went through, I have nothing to complain about and I shouldn't bother them, but it's not bothering them. It's really helping them heal and making sure that you can be there to listen first and foremost, but also come with new ideas. I know that my family is very inspired by all of the momentum that's going on right now. And it's definitely challenging preconceived notions or at least, um, you know, introducing new ideas that, that perhaps didn't feel possible up until now or up until there was a critical mass of, you know, a unified voice, a unified front. I think that the, the strength of the volume of people who showed up on the streets, both in the South and in the North, how powerful to know that there was that solidarity there. It means so much to so many. So I, again, just want to thank all of you who are in a position, you know, geographically and, and otherwise to be doing this work and know that we're here to support you, amplify your messages, do whatever else we can. Um, that Do you have any closing thoughts you'd like to share, um, Lilia? Mm -hmm. <laughs> many, but only to say <laughs> that um, I'm glad we put the word justice and goodwill in there because those things are important. Even though we're talking about peace, there can never be peace without justice. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to say is I appreciate you opening um, an avenue for the diaspora because um, being living here, sometimes you see what's happening in Cyprus and you have a different perspective on it and you want to help, but you don't know how. So yeah. this is a good vehicle as well for the diaspora of Cyprus to become more involved Mm -hmm. And for us to understand what the people in Cyprus need and want and how we can support them. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that. Of course. And thank you for contributing in all the ways that you do. Follow Venus de Louisiane if you have not. Read our poem yourself and share it with others. Share it with your grandparents and parents and friends and neighbors. <laughs> um, and please feel free to contribute to us anytime submissions are um, accepted on a rolling basis. And with that, thank you all so much. Have a wonderful night. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.